So welcome back everybody. Um, I hope you managed to have a, have a chance to, to, to leg stretch and grab a cuppa. Um, so I'm really delighted next to welcome Sasha uh, to talk to you for about 20 minutes. Um, Sasha will be covering the immigration update, um, a really, uh, really uh, topical issue, uh, very, very important, uh, particularly recruiting uh, talent, international talent. It's really important that you can navigate your way through if you're a business. And obviously, we also advise individuals and sometimes their families as well. Um, so, um, yeah. I'm really delighted to hand over to Sasha. She's very on, on, on point. Um, apparently in 2018, she actually shared the stage with Yvette Cooper at the Labour Party conference. So um, anyway, without further ado, Sasha, please go ahead and tell us more, more about what we need to know. Thanks, Jeanette, and morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. So as Jeanette said, I'm gonna be talking to you about recruitment of international workers. I always think if I put a headline of immigration, people might not necessarily appreciate that that would apply to them or their business, but you know, as we've already talked about this morning, um, all our workplaces are really diverse now, and that means that people of all nationalities are working within our organisations and will there have for have different immigration statuses. So that's something that we all need to be thinking about in terms of compliance. So if we go through to the next slide then, please. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about something that really impacts everybody in all organisations, and that's right to work checks. Um, so the Home Office have been going through a series of changes um, Due to the pandemic, we had a, a change in right to work um, processes that were businesses were required to, to undertake. Um, all those COVID concessions around right to work checks have now come to an end. So um, really the changes all took effect from 1st of October this year. So we've had a couple of months where we've been in um, under the current regime. Um, but I know it's a, it's, a big, it's a big thing for organizations to make sure they're getting a grip of with all the changes. So I thought I'd summarize them here today. Um, but in essence, since October, we have returned to doing manual in-person checks of right to work documentation. I know lots of organisations now work remotely, um, but it's now no longer possible to do a COVID remote check. Um, that being said, the Home Office have introduced new technology um, called identity service with identity service providers, which are third party contractors that will enable you to do digital right to work checks for British and Irish nationals. So if you've got a contract with one of those service providers, that would avoid you having to do a manual in person check of those um, employees that you're recruiting. Um, but for everybody else, whether they're EU nationals or other visa status holders of any other nationality, effectively, you're then required to do a right to work check using an online share code system. Um, so that system is run by the Home Office directly and is free of charge, unlike the ID service providers. Um, but it's just to kind of highlight here that we've got a difference in the, in the way that we're undoing checks and the absolute importance of doing these checks properly. All organisations are required to check right to work status for all new hire employees. Um, and obviously, since Brexit, that's a big change when we're recruiting EU nationals that you have to check something in addition to their passport. So it really is vital we get this right. If you don't do the check properly, you don't have a statutory protection if the Home Office finds you have an illegal worker and then your business is open to all sorts of penalties, which can go far as far as imprisonment in the worst case scenarios and unlimited fines. But most typically the fines are around £20,000. So um, it's, it's really important that we get this right. And the Home Office guidance is very prescriptive. So it's very easy to get it wrong. And there's a lot of guidance to, to trawl through to make sure that you're getting it right and correct. Um, so really just a reminder to make sure that you're doing right to work checks before they start. So not the day after, not in their first week, they really should not be given a laptop security pass access to the building unless you've done their right to work check. And as I say, the format of those checks is absolutely um, essential. But then if you, um, many organizations are starting to sponsor workers and giving them visas to enable them to work in the business. And it's just to highlight that there are additional requirements for the right to work check for those individuals. For example, you need to check what date they flew into the UK. Have you got any um, evidence of that? We've already talked and mentioned, I think, in the Q&A about students and, and their um, employment. There are different requirements if a person's got a student visa in terms of your right to work documentation. So important that we get that right. So if we just go to the next slide, um, and these will be shared, obviously, after the presentation. But I've just done a kind of a, a sort of easy to read chart so you know the type of check that you need to do depending on the demographic of the employee that you are hiring. So British and Irish nationals, you can either check manually 
or you can use one of the approved ID service providers with the verification technology, which is what IDVT stands for. Your EU nationals of any variety, whether they were here pre-Brexit or post-Brexit, you can use the Home Office online share system. Um, and for everybody else, again, there's an online share code system. But if they have pending visa applications, there's then a third Home Office online system. So um, it can be a bit of a minefield to navigate. I'm very happy to you know, pick up with anybody that's finding this a difficult area because there's lots to talk about. Um, but I just wanted to really highlight that there so you knew that you were aware of the changes that have come into effect since October and to make sure that you're getting that right and that the business is well protected. OK, so moving on to the next slide, um, I've got lots to canter through in the time I've got allocated. So um, what I did want to talk about is I know obviously reading the papers every day, speaking to my clients. Um, I'm sure a lot of you on this web webinar today is also experiencing the challenges in recruitment. Um, we have lots of vacancies in the UK that are not filled. And increasingly, we are looking at filling those vacancies with overseas employees. Um, so what I really wanted to highlight is that, you know, lots of organisations are now going through the process of sponsoring um, and very often that is the simplest, easiest and most effective way of getting that person into the UK. Um, having said that, my question as an immigration advisor is always, is there an alternative? Because very often there might be a, a sort of a, is either more cost effective to get them an alternative sort of visa or it puts less admin and less bureaucracy on you in HR. I know you're very busy people. Um, so there might be alternatives that you can consider. So I've just kind of summarised those on the screen there that there are a number of unsponsored routes available. Um, so students, for example, if they've got student visas, they can work, albeit only on fixed term contracts. So if you're sitting there thinking, if you ask that question, you think, well, they're all on permanent contracts. Well, actually, you might have a get out there because legally student visa holders can only work on a fixed term contract. Graduate visas, post-study work, um, post work visas, that is, for anyone that's been, been around for a while. Um, and then working holiday visas, youth mobility. So there's lots of alternatives. And I just really wanted to highlight that there. So to give you a flavour, a sponsored work visa, you're looking at anything around sort of £6,000 to sponsor that worker. Whereas a graduate visa can be obtained for a few hundred pounds and can be you know, driven by the individual themselves. So there's lots to talk about there in terms of your strategy um, to recruitment and filling your vacancies and you know, having great access to wonderful talent um, from overseas and that may or may not already be in the UK. So moving on then, um, lots of kind of hot topics. So if we go on to the next slide, I just wanted to very briefly talk about flexible overseas work requests. And I know this is an increasingly common um, topic, not least I'm sure as people depart for the Christmas break and they may want to extend their period overseas and not use annual leave and work remotely. Um, so what I just really wanted to highlight is I think a lot of organisations will look at this and say, well, we want to be really flexible. We're trying to retain our staff. We're really progressive in our how we're looking at our workforce and making it a great place to work. That's great. Um, but we obviously need to make sure that we're always compliant in how we're doing that. So um, first and foremost, I would want to say to someone, are, does the individual have the right to undertake the, the work activity in the location that they're seeking to travel to? And if they are a national of that country and they're going home to visit family, you may know, may well not have an immigration concern um, that there are other things to take into consideration, which is, you know, perhaps beyond my scope, but, you know, certainly tax and social security contributions um, that you may also need to consider. And a lot of that you'll need to look at in the round, looking at how long they're going to be in that location, how often are they going to be undertaking flexible working from overseas. Um, and ultimately, as an organisation, it might be that you need to sort of determine what's the level of risk that you're comfortable with. And uh, you may say, look, we're quite comfortable if you're going to work remotely for two weeks a year. That's great. But anything more than that would need some serious consideration. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that, you know, just because you physically can take a laptop and set up on the beach, as the, the lovely lady in the photo has here, it doesn't mean you would be operating lawfully. And what I just wanted to highlight is as no doubt people will have experienced over the summer as we've gone away, as we travel in and out of Europe, we have much more contact with border officials as British nationals in particular, asking what's the purpose of your stay? What are you going to be doing while you're here? And what we don't want is for individuals to get stopped at border because they're working and they're not meant to be and they, that country is not satisfied with that. And that works two ways, whether it's UK staff going outwards uh, overseas or, you, or overseas staff coming into the UK and wanting to work remotely. So things to consider, 
but in particular for senior company officers who might create a permanent establishment risk overseas. Um, so just wanted to highlight that. It's something that people often look at retrospectively for tax, but you do need to look at it in advance of travel because of the immigration compliance as well. Okay, next slide. And then kind of building on from that, we I know mean, fortunately we are back to a, a moment of travel, uh, a, a time of travel post COVID is that obviously now people are increasingly back to overseas work trips, perhaps not in the scale that we were previously. And I know certainly are being eco-conscious and, and you know, not making unnecessary flights as part of our new strategy for many organizations. But some post-Brexit post business travel is, uh, is inevitable and post-pandemic. So just a few things to highlight there. Again, I've already mentioned about what is the permitted activity that an individual is undertaking in that country if they are entering only as a visitor and without any kind of work permit. And unfortunately, now post Brexit, we're, you know, we don't have access to the Schengen area. Every single country has its own rules for UK nationals traveling into Europe. Um, and I just really, the key message here is that it's not the duration of the visit that determines whether or not someone needs a work visa. You could be going for as little as one or two days and the activity that you were doing would constitute work. Um, so it's important that we're aware of that. Now, by all means, business meetings are absolutely acceptable, but there's some very gray, hazy lines when you've kind of got senior officials of the company who's, you know, naturally their job is meetings. Where do you transition to that being a business meeting versus it being work in their day to day role? Um, so there's probably quite a little bit, uh, quite a bit of work to do there with organisations to think about their travel policies and making sure that you've got good awareness in the business about what is and isn't acceptable um, to make sure both the organisation isn't at risk, but the individuals travelling themselves are also not at risk. Moving on then to my next topic, um, so on the next slide, kind of just a bit of a geopolitical update. Um, obviously, we are in a period of some significant turmoil at various points around the world, not least, of course, the Ukraine uh, crisis. Um, and obviously, you've probably read in the papers and certainly I know in immigration, the Home Office has been very, very busy bringing Ukraine nationals into the UK and offering them sanctuary from the conflict. Um, so first and foremost, I want to say if anyone's approached by a Ukraine national with a, with a, Ukra a Ukraine status in the UK, you're absolutely welcome to employ them if that, and not least I'm sure that's gonna help you fill some vacancies, but that allows them to work. They can be employed, they can be self-employed. So in terms of worker status, you don't need to be concerned. It's not something you have to sponsor. And unlike certain visa categories, there's no minimum wage, no minimum salary levels required other than sort of national minimum wage, of course. Um, so really just wanted to highlight, you know, please do um, engage with those individuals if they are uh, approaching you for positions, you're, you're entirely able to do so. And then a lot of organisations are coming to me saying that we've actually got a lot of Russian nationals already in our organisation, or we're looking to recruit and we've had a Russian national, national apply for a role. So I just wanted to say that those positions are available still. Um, you can continue to bring people in from Russia. Um, undoubtedly, visa processing times are a little bit more protracted for those individuals and the Home Office are very open about the fact they're running increased security checks against all Russian applicants. But nevertheless, applications are still going through and people are able to come in. I appreciate we obviously don't necessarily have direct flight paths and lots of clients come in and out via Turkey, um, but we have no travel ban. There's no blanket uh, prohibition on uh, recruitment of Rus Russian nationals coming into the UK. So that's absolutely fine still. The other thing I wanted to mention, which often does reach HR where, um, you know, employees are just looking for some extra support or it might be creating them some sort of mental welfare challenges and they've got some anxiety about family members also in particular, is that the UK isn't offering additional sanctuary for Russian national family members who don't want to be in Russia anymore. Uh, that's a very specific political line the government are taking. So there are really very few routes to be able to bring any other family members from Russia into the UK. Um, but always happy to have a conversation to see if there's anything specific about someone's circumstances that might change that position. OK, and then moving on, um, kind of progressing from our talk about geopolitics um, in terms of the UK political landscape on our next slide then. 
um, is to say that um, we've obviously um, we've had a new home secretary. Um, she did have a little, uh, I think, 11 day break in position um, as we transitioned from Liz Truss um, to Rishi Sunak as prime minister. But we have Suella Braverman um, in, play, in situ as the home secretary. Now, all I really wanted to say on that, and I'm not here to get political about any of this, but really it's just to highlight that the current focus of the Home Office is really a huge focus on um, the um, irregular migration, those coming over in the boats. Um, obviously, we've seen the Manston Centre has been heavily dominating the press. So really, I just wanted to highlight that the Home Office's focus at the moment is on their challenges with the asylum system um, and processing of refugee uh, claims. Um, there is obviously a continuing discussion around our uh, the UK's um, place within the European Convention of Human Rights and Rwanda removals. But what I think I just wanted to highlight from a business perspective is really that just means that Home Office resources and focus is not currently on legal migration routes. So although there are things that need fixing within the system, and I you know, speak weekly with the Home Office operational team where they're making improvements and technological advances in the existing regime, we're not seeing an, a, a much of a change in terms of legal migration policy opening of new routes or alternatives. I know there's been lobbying for sector specific visas. Um, I know hospitality is struggling. Um, the care sector are looking for broadening of immigration policy to allow more people to come in. Um, so it's just to say all, all progress on that is very slow at the moment. Um, and we're probably expecting not to hear much more on policy development maybe until the April rule changes next year. Um, Operationally, though, for all the standard visas that we that we are already processing and which routes remain open for, we have seen a significant delay in processing over recent months. That is, I am happy to say, improving dramatically. Um, and again, I say I speak to, on, to the Home Office on weekly update meetings to find out what's going on, and they're really throwing everybody at it to improve processing. So we are seeing improvements in that, and hopefully there'll be more of that to come as we, you know, the Home Office get more technology online and everything's a little bit more streamlined. So um, in terms of accessing those workers or people that you may want to be recruiting and employing or then bringing their family in, things are getting better um, quite dramatically in that space, which is only good news to reduce your lag time for onboarding um, from recruitment phase. Um, and I think that's me. Hopefully that's uh, recovered some more on time, which is good. And I'm gonna pass over now to, to Jonathan who's gonna cover fire and rehire. Thanks a lot, Sasha. That was an unbelievable uh, run through of, 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 of so many different areas. Um, thankfully, I've got a much smaller um, section now. Um, I'm going to talk about fire and rehire. And the reason why fire and rehire, or well, one of the reasons why fire and rehire was so much in the news earlier in 2022 was actually a case which did not involve fire and rehire in the way in which we certainly understand it as employment lawyers. Um, it was the P&O Ferries case, which obviously hit the headlines back in March 2022. Um, in actual fact, there's only a fire in, in involved in the P&O Ferries case. There was no rehire, unfortunately, of the 786 employees um, who were dismissed um, and, and I think actually in, in that particular case, what, what effectively happened was P&O Ferries decided to avoid or to attempt to avoid um, any sort of consultation in relation to those dismissals by offering a, a package to the employees. And as far as I'm aware, all but one of those employees who was dismissed in the P&O Ferries um, case was it, it in fact accepted the compensation package. So, so the the, the rumours in the press, at least, are, are that individuals were given were given a decent package um, in order to avoid tribunal claims. Now, obviously, the reputational damage on P&O ferries was so significant from that case that, that obviously, in the round, it wasn't a successful practice from P&O. But um, it's worth just being aware of, of, of the fact that while P&O ferries put this on the map, fire and rehire involves the rehiring as well as uh, as well as the dismissal process so dismissal and re-engagement is what we used to um, describe this as um so just moving on to the first slide um and the case of Oosdor and others versus tesco stores now um in between 2007 and 2009 tesco had negotiated a, an arrangement with some of its members of staff who worked in their warehousing and their distribution centers. 
and they wanted to retain these staff when they were relocating to another to another another uh, another distribution center and the way in which they were able to negotiate this with Usdor, who was the union involved in this case was they promised um, a retention payment which was going to be an ongoing payment uh, an increase in relation to salary which was effectively similar to a bonus which was effectively going to be paid to those individuals and tesco probably quite in quite a poor uh, way from our perspective we wouldn't have necessarily advised tesco to have done this they made lots and lots of promises to his door and, and to the union uh, the union employees involved in this case that this payment was going to be in situ for life almost it was going to be guaranteed for life this payment now these were comments made in, in negotiations and, and, and discussions with Usdor and these were the kind of points which Usdor was raising when they um, applied for an injunction um, back in 2021 now Tesco contrary to what they had promised decided in 2021 probably due to the pandemic and due to various other strains on the organization that they would be looking to remove this retention payment from the employees and the employees had received it by this stage for over 10 years um, and Usdor argued that there was an implied term that that retention of payment this that retention payment would be paid to those employees until they ended their employment with Tesco so for a very very extensive period of time all the way up to retirement um, the high court somewhat surprisingly from employment lawyers and somewhat worryingly from, from an employer's perspective, the High Court decided to grant an injunction. They agreed with whose door that effectively Tesco had promised to retain these individuals all the way until, um, until uh, their employment ended at retirement in order that they could continue to receive that payment throughout their life with working for Tesco. Um, the High Court injunction effectively prevented Tesco from dismissing its own employees, which was a, a pretty staggering decision. However, there was some caveats that it was such an extreme situation where Tesco, Tesco had made so many um, promises to Usdor to, to continue to pay this amount for basically in perpetuity for, forever, um, that it probably wasn't going to happen in many other cases. The Court of Appeal saw the High Court judgment and they said, which was kind of a relief from, it, from, from an employer's perspective, that the injunction would be overturned and they did not believe it was the clear intention of the parties for those individuals to continue to be in employment, therefore receiving their retention pay forever. And effectively, they decided that they couldn't or the tribunal did not want to grant an injunction to prevent an employer from dismissing its employees. Now Tesco's proposal was effectively to pay the individuals 18 months of the retention pay as a one-off lump sum and offer them new terms on which there was no retention pay to go beyond that period of time. Tesco, without having this injunction in place, certainly were not prevented from dismissing the individuals and attempting to re-engage. But as with all dismissals and re-engagement, they would have to follow the principles of, of having a fair reason for dismissal in place. Um, move on to the next slide, please. So interestingly, even before P&O Ferry's case, ACAS had published recent guide, guidance in relation to making changes to employment contracts. Um, that was back in November 2021. It doesn't really say anything that we didn't know previously. Um, certainly the encouragement from ACAS and from the government around the time of the P&O Ferry's case is that dismissal and re-engagement should only be done as an absolute last resort by employers where they have no other opportunity to correct the kind of economic situation that the business is in. Um, they, they're trying to emphasize within this, within this that obviously um, you should make all reasonable attempts to reach an agreement with your employees about any changes in terms of terms and conditions before you move to the kind of ultimate and kind of most severe sanction of dismissing them and re-engaging them on the new terms that you want to, the, to engage them upon. So the ACAS guidance is worth having a look at if, the, if you are ever going down to this route and looking at this particular um, method because it does lay out the law in terms of the fact that you need to collectively consult in respect of changes in terms of conditions where it affects more than 20 employees. Let's move on to the last slide. 
Um, interestingly, the government around the time of the PMO Ferry case um, said they were going to do plenty of different things in relation to try and avoid that situation in the future. Now, one concrete thing that they did promise doing was a statutory code of practice on fire and rehire. Now, this was announced back in March 2022, and as far as I'm aware, there's been nothing in terms of a concrete uh, code of practice put into place as of yet. Now, when it does come in, and when it eventually does come in, it, it was originally due for publication back in the summer, but still hasn't come through, what will happen is it will operate in the same way as other statutory code of practices in the past, including the ACAS code in respect of grievances and disciplinary procedures, which means that if an employer fails to follow the code and an individual has a, a claim against the employer, for example, for unfair dismissal, they could potentially get an uplift of up to 25% compensation for the unreasonable failure to follow the the new, as it will be, um, ACAS code of practice for fire and rehire. So it's worth being aware that we are looking that the, likely that this is going to come in fairly soon. When it comes in, we'll obviously let you know via the app and, and let you know what that means. But effectively, I, I would imagine it's going to reiterate the fact that fire and rehire should be an absolute last resort and it may codify the fact that, that that's going to be the case. So I'm just going to pass on uh, at this stage to Josie. Um, uh, we look forward to any questions you have on fire and rehire at the end. Thanks Johnny. Um, so I am going to take us through some recent unfair dismissal and discrimination cases first of all um, and I'm going to start with some recent decisions about the uplift that can be applied where there has been a failure to comply with the ACAS statutory code of practice on disciplinary and grievance procedures. Now just by way of a reminder employers considering an employee's grievance or dismissing them for poor performance or misconduct are required to have regard to the ACAS code and if an employer fails to follow the code and an employment tribunal finds that that failure was unreasonable then it has the power to increase the amount of compensation that's awarded to an employee bringing a claim by no more than 25% if it considers it's just and equitable to do so. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide we will look at the case of Slade and another and Biggs and others. And in this case, the claimants, Mrs Biggs and Miss Stewart, worked at properties owned by Sir Benjamin Slade. Um, and they both notified um, Sir Benjamin that they were pregnant at different times um, in 2017. Um, Mrs Biggs went on maternity leave in September 2017 and Miss Stewart gave birth prematurely um, on the 5th of December 2017. Now Sir Benjamin considered that it was highly inconvenient that they both become pregnant at the same time and he engaged in a course of conduct which the tribunal ultimately felt was seeking to engineer their, de their departure from employment. Now he did a lot of things um, to try and do this, um, including failing to pay them correctly, um, failing to pay Mrs Biggs statutory maternity pay. He also purported to, term, uh, to transfer their employment via Tupi to a company which had no funds to pay them. He ignored their grievances. Um, he insisted that Mrs Biggs should resign um, and she actually did resign in the end when her grievances were ignored. Um, and he accused Miss Stewart of misconduct, albeit he failed to follow any process or inform her of what the allegations were. But what he did do was send her a dismissal letter, which she received on the 23rd of December 2017, uh, while she was recovering from a, a premature birth of her child. And he'd actually backdated that letter to the day before she gave birth to try and avoid paying statutory maternity pay. Um, now, rather unsurprisingly, the Employment Tribunal was not impressed with that course of conduct and it found that Miss Stewart's suspension and dismissal was one of the most egregious acts of discrimination possible and it upheld her claim of unfair dismissal and Mrs Biggs' claim of constructive dismissal and it also upheld both of their discrimination claims on the grounds of pregnancy and maternity. Now, it awarded compensation for the unfair dismissal claim and for injury to feelings and aggravated damages for the discrimination claims. Um, and it also awarded the maximum 25% uplift to reflect the failure to follow the ACAS code. Um, the employer appealed against that decision on the basis that firstly the 25% uplift was too high to be, be proportionate or acceptable. And also on the basis that applying the uplift to 
both injury to feelings and aggravated damages was double counting. Now, the EAT, the Employment Appeals Tribunal, was satisfied from the tribunal's reasoning that there was no obvious or significant double counting in the awards for aggravated damages and injury to feelings. Um, and it was also satisfied of the reasons for, for applying the maximum 25% uplift. Um, and it set out in its decision some guidance for tribunals to follow when assessing the appropriate percentage uplift for a failure to follow the ACAS code. Firstly, you look at whether it's just and equitable to award an uplift. And if so, you look at what is a just and equitable percentage, um, not exceeding, but possibly equaling 25%. Um, you look at whether the uplift overlaps or potentially overlaps with other awards um, and, and consider whether there should be an adjustment to the percentage to account for any double counting. And lastly, you should consider generally whether the sum of money um, which, is, which comes about by the application of the percentage uplift is disproportionate in any way and consider whether there's any adjustment required there. Now, this is obviously an extreme example of where things have gone quite wrong, um, but it is a reminder that the application of the maximum 25% uplift for breaching the ACAS code can add a substantial figure to the level of compensation payable by an employer, particularly in case, cases like this, where there's discrimination and then an award for injury to feelings and aggravated damages. In this case, the award alone was just over £11,000 for Miss, Mrs Biggs and just under £15,500 for Miss Stewart, so pretty significant sums. Um, now we're going to stick with the ACAS uplift and if we move on to the next slide, we'll look at the case of Rent Plus and Coulson. Um, and in this case, Rem, uh, Mrs. Coulson was employed by Rent Plus as a direction of partnerships. She worked there from 2015. Um, she was a member of the leadership team and she worked very closely with the CEO. Um, however, in March 2017, a decision was taken by the CEO to dismiss her, albeit she didn't know that at the time. Um, in autumn of 2017, that CEO stepped down and a new CEO, Mr. Collins, took over. Um, in early 2017, uh, 2018, sorry, Rent Plus undertook a reorganisation, which it described as a redundancy exercise, even though actually the number of roles would be increasing as part of the process. Uh, Miss Coulson attended consultation meetings. Um, and she also submitted a grievance that the assessment of her role as redundant wasn't accurate. And she also complained that Mr. Collins, the new CEO, had marginalised her from December 2017. Her grievance was dismissed and she was given notice of her dismissal in August of 2018. She then brought claims of unfair dismissal and sex discrimination. And the Employment Tribunal upheld her claims and they concluded that the redundancy consultation meetings were a sham as the decision to dismiss her had actually taken place long before. And the Tribunal therefore concluded that the reason for dismissal wasn't redundancy, it was a desire to remove her from her role. And they therefore awarded the 25% uplift to compensation on the basis that the company's failures were so egregious that the maximum possible uplift was required. The company appealed on the basis that the ACAS code doesn't apply to dismissals due to redundancy or sex discrimination. And the Employment Appeals Tribunal dismissed the appeal and upheld the original tribunal's decision. It also provided some more guidance on when to apply the ACAS uplift by posing a series of questions for tribunals to consider. And the first question is whether the claim is one um, that raises a matter to which the ACAS code applies. Now, obviously, the code applies to disciplinary and grievance situations, but the tribunal said that a finding of discrimination doesn't preclude the application of the ACAS code and an employer cannot sidestep it by pretending, essentially, that the dismissal is for a different reason, such as in this case, um, where the employer was, was held to be um, pretending it was a sham redundancy. Um, the EAT was ultimately satisfied that the real reason the company had decided to dismiss Ms Coulson was due to a dissatisfaction with her personality or performance, which meant therefore there was a disciplinary situation to which the code applied and it should have been followed. The second question tribunal said you should consider is whether there has been a failure to comply with the ACAS code in relation to that matter. And that will involve a consideration of the relevant provisions of the code and consider whether there, whether they have been, um, whether there has been compliance. 
Um, the next question is whether the failure to comply with the ACAS code is unreasonable. So it's not sufficient just for there to be a non-compliance with the code, it has to be unreasonable in order for that uplift in percentage compensation to be engaged. And the last question to consider is, is it just and equitable to award an uplift? And if so, by what percentage? So obviously the maximum that can be awarded is 25%. And again, the tribunal said you should take into account any overlap with other awards and any potential double counting. And in this case, the, tri the Employment Appeals Tribunal upheld the award of the maximum uplift. And it also said that actually, even if it wasn't right that there had been a disciplinary situation to which the code applied, there was a grievance situation anyway because Miss Coulson had raised a grievance and therefore there had been a total failure to comply with the code. Um, and this case just highlights the risk that whilst the ACAS code is on the face of it limited to disciplinary and grievance situations, it, it could be held, held to apply to other dismissals that are later challenged in the tribunal, including sham redundancies or discriminatory dismissals as in this case. And it just emphasises the importance of always following a fair procedure before making decisions to dismiss and ensuring compliance with the basic requirements of the ACAS code it is good practice. So if we could move on to the next slide, this just sets out what I've what I've just discussed, which is the the key points that have arisen from these cases. So um, there's a broad application of the ACAS code, and the key question is going to be whether any failure to comply is unreasonable. And um, tribunals will then look at what what percentage uplift to compensation is going to be just and equitable. Um, and obviously, as I've flagged, there are some potentially quite significant financial consequences as there were in these cases. Um, so if we just move on to the next slide, we are going to look at a, a whistleblowing case. So just moving away from the ACAS percentage uplift, and this is Secure Care UK Limited and Mott. And in this case, Mr. Mott had made various complaints to his employer about things like staff shortages, working hours, rest breaks, staffing issues, and he claimed that there was a health and safety risk. He was dismissed on the grounds of redundancy, but later brought claims in the employment tribunal. Now, he didn't have sufficient service to bring an ordinary unfair dismissal claim. So instead, he argued that his selection for redundancy was because he'd made protected disclosures or he, he was a whistleblower. Um, and that meant, he said, that his dismissal was automatically unfair. Um, the two year service requirement, of course, to bring an unfair dismissal claim doesn't apply to automatically unfair dismissal claims. And the tribunal upheld his claim. They, felt, they found that three of the alleged just nine disclosures met the test for being a protected disclosure. And they also found that in highlighting those problems to his employer, um, there had been a material effect on his selection for redundancy, making the dismissal automatically unfair. Now, the employer appealed and the EAT upheld the appeal on two grounds. Firstly, the tribunal had applied the wrong test in finding that the claimant's dismissal was automatically unfair. The proper test is whether the disclosures were the sole or principal reason for dismissal, not whether they materially influenced the dismissal um, or the employer's treatment of the claimant, um, which is actually the test applicable for claims of detriment. The tribunal had also taken into account the impact of all of the claimant's complaints that he'd raised to his employer, rather than just limiting itself to considering the only three complaints that it had held amounted to being protected disclosures. Um, so just a reminder that disclosures are not necessarily protected unless they fall within the statutory requirements for being both a qualifying disclosure and protected. Um, in addition, the test for establishing that a dismissal is automatically unfair requires that the protected disclosures to have been the sole or principal reason for the dismissal. And that's a relatively high hurdle for claimants to meet, even if they are actually able to show that disclosures they've made are qualifying disclosures and protected. Um, so this is just a reminder of the correct test in terms of whistleblowing claims and also just a helpful reminder that employees with less than two years service can still seek recourse by way of whistleblowing claims. Um, so just something to bear in mind. Now, if we could move on to the next slide and the final case that I'm going to consider as part of this section, which is Allen and Primark Stores. Now, in this case, Mrs. Allen worked as a department manager in Primark. She had returned from maternity leave and requested flexible working for childcare reasons. 
Primark considered her request and they offered her some accommodation for it, but they refused to agree that she wouldn't have to work on Thursday late shifts. She then brought a claim for indirect sex discrimination and she argued that Primark had applied a policy criterion or practice or what we refer to as a PCP that department managers had to guarantee their availability to work on Thursday late shifts and that therefore disadvantaged women because of their child caring responsibilities. Uh, to assess the discriminatory impact, the Employment Tribunal considered a comparison pool, and that pool included all department managers in the store who might be asked to work on Thursday late shifts. And that included two male department managers who had an implied contractual right not to work Thursday late shifts, but did so in emergencies. And the tribunal concluded that the PCP affected these two men and Miss Allen, and therefore didn't put women at a disadvantage and wasn't discriminatory. The tribunal rejected her claim and she appealed and the EAT upheld her appeal on the basis that the tribunal had selected the wrong pool for comparison. Miss Allen had identified the PCP as being a requirement that she guaranteed her availability to work on Thursday late shifts, not that she simply might be asked to do so. The two male managers therefore weren't subject to the same requirement, meaning that the tribunal hadn't properly engaged in determining the PCP for the purposes of establishing a claim of indirect discrimination. The EAT set aside the tribunal's decision and remitted the case to be reheard. Now that doesn't mean that the EAT has upheld the indirect discrimination claim, it's decided um, that the tribunal's conclusion that there was no um, indirect discrimination in Primark's refusal to allow her flexible working request is unsafe, meaning that the case will then be reheard. Um, so this is just a useful illustration that even if an employer has followed the correct statutory procedure for dealing with a flexible working request, a refusal of a request can result in claims for indirect discrimination here on the grounds of sex, but it also could be on the grounds of other protected characteristics, for example, disability. Um, so employers should always be alert to that possibility when considering flexible working requests. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, um, I'm now going to look ahead at some future government proposals. Now, these are things that we expect to be on the horizon, notwithstanding the recent changes that we've seen in the government. So I'm going to kick off with four private members bills. The first is the neonatal leave and care, uh, sorry, leave and neonatal care leave and pay bill which will allow parents to take up to 12 weeks of additional paid leave to care for a baby requiring neonatal care on top of their rights for uh, to maternity and paternity leave. This will apply to parents of babies admitted to hospital up to the age of 28 days who have a continuous stay in hospital of seven days or more and the right to take leave will, will apply from an employee's first day of employment and the right to pay will apply if they've had at least 26 weeks of ser service. <clears throat> so the second um, bill is the Employment Allocation of Tips Bill, um, which will ensure that all tips go to workers and make it unlawful for businesses to retain a service charge. There will be a, statute, a code of practice um, that will provide businesses and staff with advice on how tips should be distributed and workers will have a new right to request more information about an employer's tipping record. And it's been estimated that this would benefit over 2 million workers in the hospitality, leisure and service sector. Um, the third bill is the Protection from Redundancy Pregnancy and Family Leave Bill. Um, and this also has government support and would allow for employees returning from maternity leave or other family leave to enjoy some protection against being made redundant for a protected period following their return from maternity. So they currently have that beforehand and it's just proposing to extend that, um, that protection. The exact details will be set out in the regulations, but we think it's likely to mean an extension of the current rule that employees who at risk of redundancy during maternity or other family leave should be offered or given priority for suitable alternative work if there is a vacancy available. Now the last um, bill is the carers leave bill which will introduce a new and flexible entitlement of one week's unpaid leave per year for employees who are providing or arranging care. It will be available to eligible employees from the first day of their employment. 
And just to flag that all of these will require regulations to set out the details and a, a consultation on the proposed code, code of practice for TIPS, meaning in practice, we think we're unlikely to see these enforced before late 2023 or perhaps even 2024. Um, so if we could just move on to the next slide. This is public sector exit pay. So the government has issued a new consultation on proposals for a new uh, administrative controls process for public sector exit payments over £95,000. The stated intention is to allow for additional scrutiny and assurance of exit decisions, supporting the government's wider ambition to reduce the use of large exit payments in the public sector. Now, you right, might remember the previous regulations in force between November 2020 and March 2021, which were also intended to limit public sector exit payments above £95,000. Those were revoked in March 2021 due to un the unintended consequences of the cap and various legal challenges. So the new non-statutory proposals are to introduce an expanded approvals process for employee exits and a requirement for exits involving a total payment of more than £95,000 to be approved by the Secretary of State. And that figure will include relevant statutory, contractual and discretionary payments. Um, the proposals would apply to all relevant parts of the public sector. And the government could also consider that special severance payments made in central government should be recoverable in certain circumstances where an individual finds employment again in the public sector. It envisages that this would be uh, through the, the inclusion of specific repayment clauses, presumably under the terms of a settlement agreement. Um, draft guidance on public sector exits has also been published alongside the consultation, setting out the criteria for employers to consider before de deciding on the exit of an employee and for agreeing any special severance payments and the process for approval. Um, so if we could go on to the next slide. We have a review of hybrid and distance working, obviously brought about by the changes from the pandemic. Um, and on the 27th of July 2022, the Office of Tax Simplification, OTS, published a scoping document for the review that it is going to undertake, examining the tax and social security implications of changing working practices and the increase of hybrid and district distance working. The scoping document sets out themes which will be covered in a call for evidence on the emerging trends and tax implications of hybrid and distance working. The practices being considered include home working, hybrid arrangements, employees working overseas for UK employers, and employers working in the UK for overseas employers. And the review will focus on income tax, national insurance contributions and corporation taxes and consider the evidence of and research into how the trends in working practices are likely to develop over time. Um, the OTS announced that it would be publishing its findings before the end of the calendar year, albeit the closure of the OTS has, uh, was, been, was announced as part of the government's growth plan under Liz Truss, so it won't be undertaking any further work after this. Um, so if we just go to the final slide of this section. Um, so we're finishing off with the retained EU law revocation and reform bill, which of course was introduced by the government in the House of Commons on the 22nd of September 2022, allowing for the removal of retained EU law. Um, of course, the bill has got to be passed by Parliament and it is already subject, as you'll be no doubt aware, to significant opposition, not least by trade unions and also opposition parties have reportedly tabled a large number of amendments. Um, and you'll have seen all the press about the bonfire of worker rights. Um, we think that the most likely early casualty will be the agency worker regulations, um, but we think it's unlikely that there will see a, a wholesale repeal of CHUPI or the working time regulations. But who knows? Watch this space to find out what will happen next. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Jeanette. Thank you very much, Josie. And I'd like to call back all of our panellists and speakers today. So um, please do come back on screen, ready for our next uh, set of Q&As. 
Um, whilst they're coming back on, on screen, I'd like to say a huge thank you to them. Um, I think they've done a, a fantastic job today, so thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you very much to Beth and Natalie in the background for making everything run smoothly. We're very, very grateful for that. Um, and thank you very much for dialing in. Um, we're really grateful that you, you chose to uh, take some of your time out of your day to listen to us and to, to catch up really. And I think where we've finished is that there's lots more to come. So certainly dial in again this time next year or come to our annual um, big, big conference and uh, find out what, what's happening because I do think the government now is going to start enacting lots of things uh, and, and making things really happen so there will be lots to, to, to look at and think about and um, before I forget there will be a survey a feedback survey as soon as we come offline uh, so please please do um, give us your feedback we do we do look at it we do really care what you think and what you're interested in and what you're not interested in uh, so we do always take it they take that on board right then uh, we do have a few questions and um, they're in no particular order um, so probably starting with, I do think we had one around, um, again still Liz, for you, we've got one left over on the holiday pay issue, I think just one, um, or, or maybe there's a few more, but we'll see. So uh, we've been asked if they get, a holiday, what, what about holiday pay method for true casual workers? So say they do one week a month and then they don't return for six months, what's the situation with these sorts of people? Well, that can be distinguished from the, the situation we were talking about earlier, where it was a it was a permanent contract, although they only worked for parts of the year, it was a permanent contract. And that's where the difficulties arose, because there were large chunks of the year where they were employed, but not actually being paid. And that's what skewed the calculation of the holiday pay. But for people who are employed in short chunks of time, then... Um, calculating the holiday pay sort of at the end of that contractual period based on what hours they have worked over the preceding weeks is still the best way to go and to pay them um, at the at the end of that contract and then when they work an, another period calculate that separately for the next period of holiday yeah. um, so you can so deal with it in in a separate way because they're distinct or they should uh, be deemed uh, distinct contracts, each of which will attract a holiday pay calculation separately. Lovely, thanks Liz. So absolutely key, if you have casual workers, have a look at their contracts and make sure that you are ending those contracts when you don't need them, if there's going to be a big gap. I think that's the key, isn't it? We're saying that, you know, just have a look at those contracts to make sure they fit the circumstances that you need and that you've kind of thought about the implications because if it's a permanent contract, albeit zero hours, then you fall under the Harper and Brazil case and, and you've got more challenges around your holiday pay calculations. Um, okay, moving on. Sasha, I've got one for you. Um, how does the new IDSP service work and what are the costs for using that service? Uh, great question. Um, so the IDSP, so there's, uh, I think there's at least 12 different providers available um, and they are independent private companies. So they are home office approved. Um, they are optional because they are chargeable. Um, and I understand that every provider charges differently. So it's a bit like, you know, some do it like a mobile phone tariff where you get so many a month you can use. And if you don't use them, maybe you can roll them over if you've got a flexible contract. Other providers are treating it almost like a software licensing contract. Um, so you probably need to kind of shop around, have a few conversations to see, you know, what are the volumes of, of onboarding checks you're going to need to do to find the right price for you. But the advertised pricing is anything from sort of four pounds, I think, per check. I think I did hear something as outrageous as sort of 80 pounds per check. So um, it can be quite punchy. So worth shopping around. Um, and I've got no affiliation to either. And I think a lot of clients are still having a discussion about what's the best provider for them. Um, I have had a few sticking issues where employees have managed to bypass certain elements of the check, um, which has made them um, less kind of robust than you would like. Um, so and then also there are providers such as the post office that are buddied up with a tech company they have the added benefit, for example, that they have in-person services around the country. So it really is up to you and your, your employee base as to what's best. Lovely, thanks so much, Sasha. Um, Josie, there's, there's, there's three, three uh, questions for you. They're all very similar because it's about when, 
when we can expect this legislation. So you went through a list of some of the things, the private members bills that, that we have. Uh, the one was about TIPS, and I think you said we're thinking for the TIPS allocation late 2023, maybe 24, is that right? Are we anticipating yeah. if it is. Yeah, exactly. So I think for all of the for all four of them, we're watching this space, waiting for regulations. Um, there'll, there'll have to be a consultation on the code of practice that's proposed for the for the tips bill. And so we're sort of tentatively expecting late um, 2023, perhaps even 2024 for them all. Um, but we'll we'll have to wait and see. Okay. If I could, if I could maybe just jump jump in there as well and, and just say you know it's, it's highly unusual that we've got four of these private members bills yes. that are working their way through parliament normally we would have expected government uh, legislation um, perhaps in the form of an employment bill which of course we were all expecting earlier this year and and didn't materialize so um, the government are kind of fulfilling some of its promises almost by the back door here by having these private members bills but they've got to work their way through the sort of parliamentary process which will take time and um, most of the bills themselves are actually really really short they don't have any of the detail in them so once those are in place they'll then be um, sort of implementing reg regulations that will set out a lot more of the details so we don't have a lot of the detail at the moment and that whole process is going to take quite a long time so I think at the earliest we're looking at sort of the back end of 23 and into 24 none of that is going to happen particularly quickly as far as I'm aware. That's really helpful thank you Liz um, and actually we might have a, a typo here or, or, or an error just in the in the slide so um, somebody might have spotted it but it's carers leave bill um, can I just check carers leave it's one week of unpaid leave from the first day of employment, not as stated on the slide in the first year. And I haven't got the, the, the That's particular right, slide. Yes. It, it is from the first day. That is a typo. It's the first day of well employment. Well done. Well spotted. <laughs> <laughs> I won't uh, shout out who, who that was, but uh, well spotted. And thank you very much for that. So, yeah, one week's unpaid leave from the first day. Um, flexible working. Uh, any update on the flexible working updates? Liz, did you want to sort of mention flexible working? Yeah, so we have now had the um, government's uh, response on, on its consultation. Finally, it's taken a long time to, to respond to the consultation. Um, and they have confirmed that uh, they will be um, making changes to the current system of requesting uh, flexible work. But unlike it, it, it was um, heralded as being a sort of default flexible working right, that's not really going to be the case. Um, it's really just a sort of tinkering around the edges of, of the current system. So the, the existing business reasons uh, that are in place to turn down a request are going to remain unchanged. And it's still very much going to be a case of it's the right to make a request. It's not a default right to flexible working. Um, and uh, I think the period for which an employer will have to respond to a request is going to be reduced from three months to two months so the whole process is going to need to be sort of sped up a little bit and I, the other thing to note as well is that at the moment individuals can only make one request in a 12-month period um, and under the proposed changes they will be allowed to make two requests in um, in a 12-month period so there are going to be some sort of changes to the process the idea the government is hoping that um, there'll be more of a sort of two-way discussion about what what's possible and what's not possible but effectively it's just a sort of tinkering with the existing system um, so yeah. they are the government so they've responded to the consultation confirmed that that will happen and they've also um, just this week confirmed that they are backing um, yet another private members bill um, that will help bring all of this um, into force yeah and I think as you said Josie the key thing to remember with any flexible working request however is the fact that it can be discriminatory to refuse such a request um, and that 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 uh, the legislation around discrimination indirect dis uh, discrimination could be much more powerful more expensive to, to fall foul of than the actual right to request flexible working yeah, lovely absolutely. okay um, and I think this is this is uh, another one for you. This is on disclosures. Does the decision in Mott further erode the protection of workers in poor conditions by by deterring workers from disclosures? 
And what options to uh, a whistleblowing claim are there? Um, no, I don't think it. I don't think it erodes the protection that is that already exists for whistleblower for whistleblowers. I think it just clarifies what legal test the tribunal should apply. And in that case, the tribunal had sort of gone a little bit awry and looked at a slightly different legal test than it than it should have done. Um, and it and it was also sort of straying into considering holistically everything that this employee had complained about, rather than the three things that they had decided actually qualified for protection because there's various different stages you have to go through. You obviously have to show you've made a disclosure, which is not always as easy as it sounds because you need to be quite specific in terms of what you said, when, who to, how did you say it. Um, then you need to show that that qualifies for protection. And then you need to show that you've either been subject to a detriment or that your dismissal was because of it. So they are, it's it's not necessarily an easy claim for an employee to go through, um, but, but that decision hasn't changed the the process it's just clarified it and it's just um a, a, just a useful case in terms of a reminder of what tribunals will consider and also just to always keep in mind that that protection is there um especially when you're dealing with an employee with less than two years service and you might think oh well it's a little bit more straightforward not not always the yeah. case lovely thank you um i'm delighted and thank you ever so much for uh, for the lady who has confirmed that she's downloaded the app uh, so that's fantastic news. Thank you very much indeed. I'm delighted. Um, and I hope many more of you will and that you uh, you find it useful. Do let us know. And if you've got any good ideas around it, then let, let us know about those too. Jeanette, um, another... Jeanette can yes. I just quickly jump in about the app? For anyone who's yes. not already downloaded it, we are actually in the, in the process of running a competition um, as part of the launch of it. And if you're very quick and you've downloaded it, um, before the end of the week. If you look in the news items, last week we sent out an alert on the app with a kind of secret code word that if you email into the designated address, you'll be in with a chance of winning a super prize. Um, there are more details on there. There's terms and conditions and all the proper legal stuff. Um, but yeah, have a look on the, um, if, you, if you go to the news items, you'll see there's a competition alert and that will give you the, uh, the secret code word and you could win a hammer. Very exciting. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Liz. OK, um, we have another one for you, Sasha. I'll get in towards the end of our questions now. I think this might be the last one unless somebody else uh, quickly puts one in. But can you confirm that a right to work check for a non-UK stroke Irish national must be via the Home Office? Uh, yes, so correct. So every single employee that is not British or Irish is going to have to give you a share code. And that is, um, they go online, they have their own link to the portal, um, they put in their details, it will give them a share code, then you as an employer pop that share code into the employer interface um, and download the result. The key thing to take away though is that is not job done. You then have to go through a secondary process of doing what they call an imposter check, which is a visual verification that the person presenting themselves for work matches the image on the result from the home office document and i think lots of clients forget um, they get the, they get the download they go right job done um, it is not a complete check unless you've done the visual verification and recorded that as well um, but yes share codes a go and that is free you do not have to pay for that service okay thank you and there was a uh, there was one i slightly missed uh, so i do apologize to the person here it's it says it's likely to take 20 days to re-register somebody can she continue working for us in this period? In terms I'm of a not, right to work check, yeah. I'm um, not too sure what, what the full question is, but I've got, it's likely to take 20 days to register or re-register. Can she continue working for us in this period? Does that sort um, of... I mean, ultimately it's your choice whether you allow them to continue to work. Um, my advice typically speaking was that if you don't have a valid right to work check, it would be better to suspend them. Um, temporarily whether you do that with or without pay is up to you um, but I think from a risk perspective my advice would be um, for them not to be working until you're satisfied they have the right to work properly. Okay lovely. Um, Jenny I apologise you didn't get a single question but I'm not too sure that you'll be too upset. I don't um, mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you ever so much everybody and um, so let me just uh, just finally wrap up um, as we've sort of seen today, or as I've tried to allude to, we can look after you if you've got your employment law queries, if you've got a requirement for extra resource in your HR teams with our HR consultancy, 
We do have a workplace investigations team who are legally qualified lawyers who do grievance disciplinary and whistleblowing investigations. We have employee share incentive specialists, immigration obviously with Sasha and her team and with Johnny we have a, a really outstanding training team as well. So um, that together with, uh, with our app and our uh, Burkitt's online support system, we try to make sure we cover all, all options and everything that you need. Uh, so do, do get in touch with any of us if, you, if we can help with anything at all. Um, it remains to say um, we wish you a very happy Christmas and a very happy, safe and, safe and healthy 2023, which I can't quite believe uh, we're saying. So uh, take care and thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.